bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Even in days like this, we can say that. Amen. 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 These difficult days in which we live, the things that we witness, and things we don't yet understand. But praise God, we can still say, Bless the Lord. Amen. Amen. This morning, I want us to open the Word of God together to. Psalm 22, 122, Psalm 122, 122. As I bring a message which I've entitled, Pray for the Peace of Jerusalem. On Friday afternoon, Pastor Irby and I talked on the phone uh, was supposed to begin this morning a series of messages that we're doing together on the on the teachings of Paul. But I shared with Irby, and he certainly agreed that this is not a time for a series on the teachings of Paul, as important as they are. But a look into the Word of God about the events that we're going through in these days. And in Psalm 122, Scripture speaks much of that. And so if we could stand to our feet together, holding the Word of God before us, would you commit this time to the Lord with me by just repeating these words to the Lord? Dear Father, Dear Father I hold your Word in my hands. I hold your Word in my hands. And now may I hear it with my ears. And now may I hear it with my ears. And hide it in my heart. And hide it in my heart. And honor it in my life. And honor it in my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Psalm 122, the Psalm of David, written for the people of God who are going into the city of Jerusalem for the observance of the Passover feast. In verse 1, I rejoiced with those who said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. And that is where the tribes go up the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. And there the thrones for judgment stand, the thrones of the house of David. And in verse 6, pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. And maybe there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. And may God add his blessing to his word today, and you may be seated. I must admit to you today that um, I stand before you to preach a message from the Lord. But in so doing, I identify a little bit with Job. Not in the way that we often say that we identify with Job. But as I think about his words in Job 43, after speaking so much of his theology throughout the entire book of Job, he finally stands before the Lord his God and says, I must confess that I spoke of things that I don't understand. Things too wonderful 
for me to know. You know, I've learned in recent years of my preaching, I should say that after every sermon I've preached. I often preach the things that I really don't understand. <laughs> At least not as much as he does, amen? amen? And things too wonderful for me to know. So from the very start, I just confess that to you this morning. But I pray that under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that God will speak to us through his word, amen? Amen. Psalm 122. David wrote these words for those who made their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They had come there to celebrate the Passover. And he spoke to them about the wonders of the city of Jerusalem, the city of God. And he spoke to them, first of all, about the delightful destination that Jerusalem was. But then he speaks to them about the dreadful destiny that Jerusalem faced. He spoke to them about the the delightful destination that Israel was. He speaks first in verse 1 by saying, I rejoiced with those who said to me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in the gates of old Jerusalem. He speaks of it as a delightful experience to have made that journey from the villages and towns of Israel. From all around the region, the people came flowing into the city. And they did it with rejoicing. They did it with great delight for they were coming into the city of God. I would imagine that for many of them it was the same ecstasy that all of us will experience when we walk into the city of God ourselves. With joy and triumph and singing hearts. Amen? Amen. That's what they did. And when they came to Jerusalem they saw some things about that city that probably made some of them just fall in awe before God. They saw that it was a great city. They saw that it was God's city. They saw that it was the government of God upon his people. Indeed, they saw that it was a great city. You'll notice in verse 3, It says Jerusalem is like a city that is closely compacted together. Many people have never seen anything quite like that, you know. Many of them grew up in the countryside on hillside farms, and some of them grew up in small villages where maybe there was just a street or two, maybe maybe a grocery store, maybe a Circle K, and not much to see there, you know, maybe one stoplight, if any at all. Most of them had never seen anything like the city of Jerusalem. Many of them had grown up in towns where perhaps they had some number of people living there, but nothing like the population of Jerusalem. And so David really makes sure that they understand that Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. There was more to see in Jerusalem than most of those people had ever seen before. It was a walled city with busy streets and marketplaces, magnificent temple, the great iron gates, palaces and towers, and all the enmities of urban life. Indeed, it was a great city. And can I tell you something? It still is. 4,000 years after these words were written, Jerusalem is as great of a city as it's ever been. That's why everybody wants it. Uh, Jerusalem, people that would come through those gates would be seen as nothing less than a great city. But more than just being a great city, it was God's city. The Lord laid claim of it himself. He called it himself the city of God. 
For it wasn't only a spectacular place, but it had a spiritual presence there. For it was there in Jerusalem that the temple was built. It was there in that city of Jerusalem that God dwelt in the temple. That's why Hezekiah, godly King Hezekiah, could say that the temple was filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Because God dwelt in that city. It was his city. It was indeed the place where people could draw and meet with God. They would never see him physically. They would never experience his physical presence, but his spiritual presence certainly was there. It didn't stay there, by the way. For a time came when the rebellion of the Israelites became so great that God moved out of the temple. Well, that was fine, because you know what? The day came when he moved into a human body in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> the one who is Emmanuel, God with us. And all of us now can experience his spiritual presence. Amen? Amen. It was the city of God. A great city. It was God's city. But it was also a city of government. You'll notice what it goes on to say in verse 5. There the thrones for judgment stand. The thrones of the house of David. The capital of the Israelites had not always been Jerusalem. Before it was Jerusalem, it was Hebron. Uh, David, when he became king, he decided to move out of Hebron and move to Jerusalem. And he established his kingdom there. And there was established the throne of David. But more than that, there was established the very throne of God himself. It became the center of secular power. It became the place where the Israelites were governed. You know, in the temple, with the spiritual presence of God, holiness was encouraged. But in Jerusalem, at the throne of David and the throne of God, holiness was enforced. For that was indeed the very seat of the government of the people of Israel. And every person who went there to, to observe the Passover would have walked into that city with great delight and great rejoicing, saying, finally, I have made it to a spectacular place. I've entered into the city with the spiritual presence of God and I've come into a place of great secular power. Everything about Jerusalem would have enthralled them. You've had that experience perhaps if you've walked into the city of Washington, D.C. and you've seen all of its monuments and all of the buildings and the seat of power that Washington, D.C. is. Let me tell you something, that would be nothing compared to Jerusalem. And no matter where you go on earth, let me tell you something else. There is no place like Jerusalem. I've never been there, but if one of you wants to sponsor me, I'd be glad to go. <laughs> David says it's a delightful destination. But having said that, he says it has a destiny of destruction. You'll notice what he says in verse 6 of Psalm 122. Pray. Pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And that prayer should say, May those who love you be secure. And may there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my brothers and friends, I will say peace be within you, O Jerusalem. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. 
you know, the strangeness of that prayer is the meaning of the name Jerusalem in the first place. For Jerusalem means the city of peace. None of us have ever known a Jerusalem that has been a city of peace. In fact, throughout all of its history, it's been just the opposite. It's been a city of hostility, a city of violence, and of chaos, and of war, but little peace. <coughs> you know, when someone says, you need to pray for brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, pray for their health, it's not because they're healthy, amen? It's because they're sick. And David, when he, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, it wasn't because peace existed. It was because David, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, knew that this was indeed a city that has a destiny of destruction. Throughout its history, there have been at least three dozen times that that city has been besieged. It's been besieged by Egypt and Syria and Assyria and Babylon and Rome. It's been besieged by Nebuchadnezzar, Ptolemy, Antiochus the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, Pompey, Vespasian and Titus. It's been besieged by Muslims and Crusaders. It's been besieged in ancient days. It's been besieged in modern days. And the day is coming. We know from what the scripture tells us that it will be besieged as the great army comes from the north and takes that city with the help and the power of the Antichrist and the nations of the world who come against it. And even after the millennial reign in the Battle of Megiddo, Jerusalem is a city that's destined for destruction. It's a city that's already been destroyed at least twice. But like the body of Jesus Christ, <laughs> you might destroy it, but you can't keep it down. Uh, it rose again, you know, just like Jesus did. And it will keep on rising. Uh, any nation that wants to come against her and destroy her will find that their, their, their efforts are nothing more than mere futility. <laughs> because God will always raise her up again. That's his city, you know. But there's going to be a day when it will be ultimately and finally destroyed. But I mean, it won't be the hands of man that do that. It will be the hands of God. When the old things have completely passed away and the heavens and the earth are burnt up in a huge fire and God creates a new heaven and a new earth. And as we're taught in Revelation chapter 21, there's going to be a new Jerusalem, the city of God that will come down from heaven. And all of us are going to spend time there in the presence of Jesus. Amen. What a day that will be, amen. What a day that will be. Well, that's a short exposition of Psalm 122. A delightful destination, but destined for destruction. And David says to the Israelites and says to us today, pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So that's what we're going to do today in just a little while, but before we do that, I really want to say a few things 
concerning that. For we know that in the ancient days that Jerusalem was besieged time and time again. But we're not living in the ancient days. We're living in the, in the last days. Amen? Amen? We're living in the last days. Oh, I believe that the time is coming near that Jesus is coming again. Amen? We're living in the last days. I can understand what David had to say about Jerusalem in the ancient days although I wasn't there. Uh, but I'm still struggling to understand about Jerusalem in the present day, in these last days. And so for just a few moments this morning, I want to center on a few very important things. There are six of them. Prophecies, precursors, the present, promises, the people of God in prayer. And I want to encourage you, by the way, this morning, if you're not taking notes, you should be. In fact, I'm not going to encourage it. I'm going to insist upon it. If you have something to write with, you just need to. At the end of this message, I'm going to be telling you about practical and very important things that we need to be doing as the people of God. I don't want you to have to leave here and listen to it again later on YouTube. I want you to be able to write these things down and take it home and do what the Word of God tells us to do in these dark and dreadful days in which we live. Now that you're writing things down, amen, write down this word, prophecies. But we all understand that the Old Testament and the New Testament is full of prophecy, right? There's many of them in the Old Testament. There's many of them in the New Testament. I'm going to refer to two of them. One from the book of Zechariah, the 12th chapter. And one from Ezekiel, chapters 38 and 39. The one in Zechariah, and by the way, if you don't know how to find the book of Zechariah, the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi, and right before Malachi is his neighbor Zechariah. And by the way, the 12th chapter is right after the 11th chapter. <laughs> and in the 12th chapter of Zechariah is one of the most profound prophecies given to us in the Old Testament, especially as it centers around the city of Jerusalem. And by the way, when we talk about the city of Jerusalem, we're talking about the nation of Israel as a whole. Just as when we refer to Moscow, we think of the Russians, and we think of Tehran, we think of Iran. When we think of Jerusalem, we think of the Israelite people and their nation. But in Zechariah chapter 12, there the Lord speaks about things that are going to take place in Jerusalem, in Judah, and in all of Israel. You'll notice in verse 1, this is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Aren't you glad we have a word from the Lord concerning Israel? <clears throat> if we didn't, we would be in a fix. Do you realize that God has the distinct advantage of being able to give to us a history of the future. No one else can do that. But God does. A history of the future. He says, The Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the spirit of man within him declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. And on that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her. Do you hear that? When all the nations of the earth are gathered against her. I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for the nations. In other words, it will not be taken. It will be like a rock that no one can lift. And all who try to move it will injure themselves. 
You know what that word literally means that was written in the Hebrew? That all who try to lift it will be torn into pieces. Amen. And on that day, I will stro- strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah. Aren't you glad that God does that? He keeps a watchful eye just as he keeps a watchful eye over me and over you and over us. He keeps certainly a watchful eye over Israel. But I will blind all the horses of the, of the nations. And then the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. And on that day, I will make the leaders of Judah like the fire pot of a wood pile, like a flaming torch among the sheaves. They will consume the right and the left and all the surrounding peoples, but Jerusalem will remain intact in her place. And the Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first, so that the honor of the house of David and of Jerusalem's inhabitants may not be greater than that of Judah. And on that day the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest among them will be like David and the house of David will be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. And on that day I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. That's quite a prophecy, amen. He says the day is coming. The day is coming when all the nations will rise up against Jerusalem. Jerusalem will have no defender. Israel will know no defense except for the defense of God. And it reminds me of the passage of Scripture that says, If God be for us, who can be against us? That will be the resounding testimony of the nation of Israel in the day of the Lord that is coming. When the nations rise up against Jerusalem and against the Jewish people and God and God alone will come to her defense. I believe that Israel is in good hands when they are in God's hands. Amen. But there's another prophecy that we need to pay attention to. I don't care necessarily for you to turn there, but it's in Ezekiel chapter 37 and 38, or 38 and 39, and you need to write that down. And the reason you need to write that down is because you need to go home and you need to study chapters 38 and 39 of Ezekiel. For in there we see that there is going to be a coming battle. What we see on the news today is not that, but it's leading to that, I believe. A great battle which will really include three main characters, not including Israel, but Israel will be included. But as you read chapters 38 and 39, you will see that it speaks of a nation from the north, and there is no doubt that that nation among most biblical interpreters is the nation of Russia, who will form an alliance with, no big surprise, Iran, and also an alliance with Turkey. Those will be the big three. Russia, Iran, and Turkey. But then there are those nations of the upper Nile region that will join along with them. And nations really all across the globe. Because if you believe what scripture says, you believe that all the nations will rise up against Israel. We call this battle that is mentioned here the Battle of Gog and Magog. Though it happened in the last days. Russia, Iran, and Turkey. It's interesting to understand that prophecy is being lived out before us in this present day 
for it, you have the nation of Russia, which is already siding in this latest conflict in Israel with the Palestinians. In fact, it was just last Wednesday that uh, President Putin of Russia declared that if the United States sides with and supports Israel, then Russia will side with and support the Palestinians. Well, that was no announcement he needed to make. He started doing that a long time ago. He has already set his target on Israel and supported the Palestinians and simply his the target of the United States as well. And there is this this group that you've heard a lot about in recent days, because it's right in the middle of the conflict, it is Hamas. Uh, do you know what right, Russia's relationship to Hamas is? <coughs> there is a group that you've heard about called the Wagner Group, out of Russia, a military group that not long ago finished its incursion into Africa, and after it had caused its trouble there, it made its way to Palestine to the Palestinians, where they trained Hamas how to do warfare against Israel. All the training that they needed, all the training that they've gotten, they've gotten from one place, and that is from Russia. How many of you understand that prophecy is already unfolding before our eyes? And it doesn't end there. Remember the three characters being Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Iran is the main financial supporter of Hamas. They give billions of dollars to arm Hamas. You know, Iran will say, we haven't done a thing. Well, they've done everything. They've supported them financially. They have their direction. They have their blessing to do whatever they want to to the nation of Israel. That Iran is actually using the the party of Hamas to do destruction to the nation of Israel with their full support. The real shame of that is not too long ago our own American president, President Barack Obama, sent 1.12 million dollars over to Iran in cash as an appeasement to the Iranians. Trump came along a few years later and, and after, after Obama had promised there was another 100 billion coming and Trump came along and canceled that deal, amen? Canceled it all together. But our current president has reignited that deal and has already given six billion dollars to the Iranians. All of that under the guise of, well, you know, this is just humanitarian support. Well, let me tell you something. Iran doesn't need humanitarian support. It's one of the wealthiest nations on this earth. But all of that money is helping to fund terrorist groups like Hamas that are fully supported financially by the Iranian government. May God give wisdom to the leaders of our own country here in the United States. Amen. And there's Turkey. Turkey, whose president just this past week declared that the Israelites were targeting Palestinians. The Palestinians are the victim and have recent years entered into an anti-ballistic missile system along with Russia. A prophecy is unfolding before us. Are you smelling what I'm barbecuing? Scripture is quite clear. Prophecy has been given that Jerusalem is indeed destined for destruction, except for God is on her side. Well, when we move in Further into the present day, we, we see some precursors, that is, events that precede and, and bring into 
existence, the approach of other events. You know, this whole thing didn't start last Saturday, October the 7th. It's been going on for a long, long time, amen? And there were some precursors in recent history to the events of last week, really beginning in May 14th of 1948, where the UN, the United Nations, declared Israel as a sovereign nation. Well, Scripture had predicted that. It was really a part of the signs of the times of the coming of our Lord. And when they declared Israel as a sovereign state, they didn't have a country. But now they would. Because the United Nations partitioned the land and they said the Israelites can live here. The Arabs will live here. And you all will get along as neighbors. Well, it didn't take long for that to fizzle out. But it was the very, very next day, right after Israel had gladly accepted what the UN had decided and gladly accepted their partition of the land uh, the Arab nations rose up and said we're not putting up with this uh, that country of Israel doesn't even have a right to exist much less do they have a right to take our land and the very next day after the land had been partitioned war broke out War broke out against the Jews by the Arab nations that surrounded it, and they attacked Israel. And this coalition discovered that this little nation of Israel, not even the size of New Jersey, had a quite powerful punch for not even having an army. This was a people who had no military force at all. These were a people who had no way of defending themselves, but they had a great defender who would do that job. And they were victorious. Listen, if, if you don't understand the history of Jerusalem and the history of Israel, then you have not yet seen what real miracles look like. God defended them in that great incursion of all the Arab nations. <laughs> And there was some relative peace for a little while until 1967 when the Egyptians decided that they had had enough of Israel and they invaded Israel, a surprise attack, just like what was seen last Saturday. They were joined by Syria and Lebanon and Iraq and Jordan. All those mighty nations surprise attacked Israel. It seemed that Israel would have no hope and no future. But within just days, they were indeed victorious. Listen, uh, don't mess with Israel. 1973 came around and there was the war of Yom Kippur. That was a war that happened during the great festival of that holy that holy day that the Israelites worshipped God, committed themselves all over again to living in holiness. And the Arabs chose that day to attack in 1973, 50 years ago this past week. I'm going to say more about that war in just a few moments. But we're talking about precursors, things that have preceded the events of last week. We can't forget August 18th of 1988 in what was known as the Hamas Charter where the Hamas party, that terrorist organization wrote its own charter and in Article, chapter, in Article 13 this is what is written there. There is no solution for the Palestinian question except through jihad initiatives, proposals, and international conferences are a waste of time and a vain endeavor. And once and for all it was sealed, especially among the party of Hamas, there will be nothing that will satisfy us in all the world except for the total destruction 
of Jerusalem. If you only think that affects lands across the sea, it was just in recent days that the Hamas chairman said these words, the entire planet will be under our law. There will be no more Jews or Christians. The entire 510 million kilometers of this planet will come under our system where there is no injustice, no oppression, no Zionism, and no treacherous Christianity. They are dead set on only one thing, and that is the death of the nation of Israel and every Jew and every Christian, including you and me. If you wonder if in these days we're fighting against evil, all of us can be convinced indeed Indeed we are, amen. Indeed we are. Well, those were the precursors to what's happening in the present. On October 7th, last Saturday, a week ago, Hamas unexpectedly committed a Pearl Harbor type act against Israel. With no intelligence to tip them off and no reason to believe that something as horrific would happen as it did, Hamas attacked. Within hours, 3,500 rockets were indiscriminately, randomly launched into Israel. An unprovoked attack killing thousands, including at the last count that I've heard, 29 American people. The bloodiest days in recent Israeli history, all at the hands of a party called Hamas. You see, Israel, when it declared war, didn't declare war against a nation. Hamas is not a nation. It didn't declare war against the Palestinians. It declared a war against Hamas, which is a radical Islamic terrorist organization. It Really, the word Hamas comes from an acronym, which would be in another language, but in our language, it would mean the Islamic Resistant Movement. And it was a few years ago that when the Gaza Strip was given completely over to the Palestinians, how many, this don't believe the lie that, that, that the Israelites have been occupying the Gaza Strip. They haven't. They, years ago, told the Palestinians, we don't care for the Gaza Strip. We don't want to build there. We don't want to do anything. We're going to give it to you. And they did. And then Israel built a wall. Said, we'll stay on your side. You stay on your side. That's yours. You can have it. Even our media today is trying to convince us that Israel are oppressors and holding captive the people of Gaza. That's not true. That land was given to them. Israel didn't have to give it to them. It had been given to Israel. It belonged to Israel, but Israel gave it as a gift to the Palestinians as a token of friendship and peace. And when that was given to them, they needed a political leader, the people of Gaza did. And so there came into power this group called Hamas, which is nothing more than a radical Islamic terrorist organization. It is not truly a government. It is not a nation. It is a, a party of terror in the Middle East. And that group called Hamas denies Israel's right to exist and seeks nothing except for Israel's total destruction. And that's why they could launch so many missiles and kill so many innocent people indiscriminately letting rockets fall where they fall and kill who they kill. This whole war is about only one thing, that one side desires the total destruction of the other. And God bless the Israelites 
There is no doubt that the Israelites aren't perfect. They never have been. They won't be perfect in this war. But they're right. And God's people and this country need to stand on the side of Israel through thick and thin. I'll take an amen on that. <coughs> That's the present day situation. I've had quite a heavy heart over the past week. I spoke to my staff at work in that conference room with my 11 staff members sitting around the conference table. I ended that staff meeting, which we have every week, and I said, I just want you all to know that um, what you saw in the news last weekend is not just another event in the Middle East. This one's different. And I said, you know, you need to speak to your children. You, you need to understand the times. You need to make yourself ready for whatever may come. This may come to a conclusion and we'll go on to the next thing. Or this may just be the very beginning of the great conclusion of all things. And I'm going to say to you that when I first heard about missiles being launched into Israel last Saturday, I was tempted just to roll my eyes and say, here we go again. But then I came to realize this is different. This is different. Can I tell you something? Though this may be different, God's promises are still the same. Amen. Amen. The fourth P that I want you to write down is, is the promise. We looked at the prophecies and the pre precursors and the present day, but I want us to think about the promise of God. And the promise of God is found in Psalm 121 and verse 4. <laughs> what a great promise this is. He who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Amen. Can I say that again? Amen. He who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Let me tell you something. He's been watching over Israel for a long, long time. He's never slumbered or slept. He watched over them during 400 years of slavery in Egypt. And he didn't sleep or slumber. He watched over them over 40 years of wandering in the desert. <coughs> He's watched over them during two total destructions of Jerusalem, multiple deportations of the Israelites, 2,000 years of being dispersed with no country in which to call home. He watched over them during World War II, during the Holocaust, when six million Israelites were killed. He watched over them during the great incursions of 1948 and 1967 when all the odds were stacked up against the Israelites but a God who watches over them was a God who would not sleep nor slumber and then came 50 years ago 1973 a war that Israel got involved in over the Suez Canal Egypt decided that the Israelites should have no place or control over the Suez Canal. And so Egypt and Syria, just as happened last week, surprise attacked Israel. But it wasn't just Egypt, Egypt and Syria, those mighty militaries. But they were joined by Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Jordan, Iraq, Libya, Kuwait, Morocco, Cuba, and even North Korea, who launched a vicious attack against the Israelites. 
The world watched in horror in 1973, thinking there was no chance of Israelites' existence. The nation of Israel had 400,000 troops. Those enemies, the coalition of enemies, had over 1 million troops. The Israelites had 1,700 tanks, but the enemy had 3,500 tanks. Israel had 3,000 armored carriers, but the enemy had 4,000 armored carriers. <coughs> Israel had 945 artillery units. The enemy had 1,720 armored units. The nation of Israel only had 440 combat aircraft. The enemy had over 500 in, uh, military combat aircraft. They were outnumbered. The Israelites were outpowered. But do you know what happened? There was a God who was watching over Israel, who in 1973 chose not to sleep or to slumber. And in the end, there were 2,800 Israelites dead, but over 8,000 of the enemy dead. 8,800 Israelites wounded, 35,000 of the enemy wounded, 293 Israelite hostages and prisoners, but 8,750 prisoners of the enemy. Israel can rejoice today that they have a God who's watching over them, who will neither sleep nor slumber. And God on October Sabbath of 2023 wasn't sleeping or slumbering. And even now, God still, still is wide awake and watching over the nation of Israel. And that is indeed a great promise. The same God who watches over you and watches over me. The same God who Hagar looked up into heaven and said, You are the God who always sees me. The whole nation of Israel can rest assured. He who watches over her will neither slumber nor sleep. What a Savior we have. I want us to consider the fifth thing, and that is the people of God. I could tell you all kinds of things about what happened the last week, but certainly, certainly we, we all know the things that happened. We don't understand it all, but we, we know what we hear. The question is this, is what do we do as the people of God? And I'm going to give you a list of things. If you haven't written anything else down, write this. If you're not sitting there to write on, write it on your arm. And don't wash it off till you've written it on something permanent. Because these are the things that the people of God need to do. If you're ready, say amen. amen. First thing, above everything, trust Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Amen. And do it now. I, I was supposed to preach about that very thing today. In our teachings of Paul series, we're going to start with what he teaches about salvation. And I'm going to tell you today that that's an important message. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you need to do it now. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But oh, sometimes we forget about verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world would be saved. The day is coming and it's soon to come when Jesus Christ will come again. And when he does, he will condemn the world. 
But for us who have chosen to accept him, we can say he came not to condemn us. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. But to be saved. If you've never accepted him as Lord and Savior of your life, you need to do so. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Amen. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I have no doubt in my mind that in a group the size of this one and of those who are watching on Facebook or YouTube, there's somebody you've never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. I'm telling you, don't wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow may not be here. But do it. Do it now. That's the first thing you need to do. Second thing you need to do is be in the Word. Be in the Word of God. I've spent a lot of time. I've done this for years and years. I spend a lot of time every day watching the news. I watch the news three or four hours a day. I try to stay up with what's going on in the world. I want to hear what's happened. But can I tell you this? There's something greater than knowing what's happened. That is knowing what's happening and what's going to happen. Amen? And you can't know that unless you open up the book, which is a history of the future. And as you look into the scriptures and you read what God has to say about all the events in the world and what's going to happen in the world, then it will inform you. But not only will it inform you, but as a child of God, it will encourage you that these are the terrible things that will befall those who have rejected him, but those who have accepted him will be saved. And it serves as a warning to all of us that we need to work as long as it is day for the night is coming when none of us can work. Study the scriptures which, as Paul said to Timothy, are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Trust Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Be in the word. Number three. As the people of God, we need to be aware. I think of the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13. When Paul said to the Corinthians, Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous and be strong. If you think all the events that are happening in the world are happening across a great ocean somewhere, you may be very wrong about that. Currently, we have an open border to our south. We have people coming across our border who we don't even know who they are. They're not just coming from Mexico and South America. They're coming from Russia and from China, and from the Middle East. We don't even know who they are or why they're coming here. In 2018, there were zero arrests of people crossing our border that were on the FBI terrorist watch list. This year alone, we've had over 150 that were on that terror watch list. But most people who have come across the border have not been caught, have not been known, have not been seen. This isn't just something happening in Israel in the Gaza Strip in the Middle East. This is something that's probably has already come to our own country. And so be aware. Amen. Have your head on a swivel, so they say, amen. amen. Be on your guard, Paul says to the Corinthians. And stand strong in your faith. Be courageous and strong. Especially living in a city like San Antonio where access to our city from the border is so easy. And our military presence here, we should be aware, amen? Be aware. 
The next thing we need to do as a people of God is be faithful. Be faithful. Jesus, in speaking of the calamitous things that are to come upon this planet in the day of the Lord, he gave this word. He says, he who stands firm to the end, the same are those who will be saved. To stand firm means to remain faithful. Not that through our faithfulness that we earn our salvation somehow, but rather those who are truly saved are those who will stand firm to the end. That will be a proof of the salvation that we've already received. Then Peter, as he was writing the second Peter, he said these words as he spoke about the dreadful last days and the coming of the Lord. He says in chapter 3 and beginning in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. And since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to be holy and godly as you look forward to the day of God and you speed its coming. For that day will bring the destruction of heavens by fire and the elements will melt in its heat. But in keeping with the promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of the righteous. And so then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, are you looking forward to it? Amen. He says this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Amen. Be faithful. Be ready and watching. Luke chapter 21 and verse 28, after Jesus was speaking about the things that are to come, he says, when you see these things taking place, lift up your eyes. <coughs> lift up your eyes for your redemption is drawing near. Oh, I believe that we're lit. You know, yesterday, how many of you lifted up your eyes to see the solar eclipse? I tried, but it was too bright for these eyes. I couldn't see a, a thing of it. I didn't really care to all that much. I don't think the whole thing lived up to its hype, to tell you the truth. But I'll tell you what's going to. Jesus says, when you see all these things taking place, I think we're starting to see them. He says, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes for your redemption draws near. How I many of you know Jesus is coming and coming soon. Uh, listen, it's been a long time ago that I stopped looking for the signs. Now I'm looking for the sun. I've stopped looking for the signs. I'm listening to the sound of the great trumpet of God. It's going to sound when Jesus is coming back. And I believe with all of my heart, Jesus is coming and coming soon. You know, we went through covid and when we went through COVID, many of us began to ask as life became so abnormal, we started thinking, when is normal coming back? And then after COVID or along with COVID came all the George Floyd and all the BLM movement and all the riots and all the looting and all the wokeness and the liberalism in our country being so, so, so radicalized. And I just couldn't help but ask every day, I, I want normal to come back. And just when you think that COVID is over and our nation might be calming down a little bit, then this happens last weekend and nothing is normal again and I just want normal to come back. Can I tell you something? Normal ain't coming back. Nor I don't care all that much because normal was never that good anyway. Normal is not coming back. <laughs> But Jesus is. Amen. Jesus is. Be watchful and be ready. And the last thing we need to do as the people of God is just trust. Trust in the Lord. Can you do that? When the days are dark and dreadful and dangerous and disastrous, can you, no matter what, just trust in the Lord? 
You can trust his presence. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. You can trust his power to keep you. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8, He will keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Christ Jesus. And you can trust in his promise. That last promise of the whole Bible that Jesus gave. And he said, yes, I am coming soon. Do you trust him for that? Do you trust him for that? Well, those are the peas I told you I was going to give, except for one last one, and that is prayer. It's really where we began. Psalm 122, pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Shame on us if we don't obey, obey that instruction. Shame on us if we don't take advantage of this morning of being gathered together as God's people and we spend time in prayer. I've been going quite some time now, but I think I'm just about done. But we're not. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. And as you stand to your feet, I want you to look around this, this small auditorium. And I want you somehow to divide into groups of four or five people. And I want you in groups, maybe you'll choose a leader of your group. But I want you to spend time as a group, hand in hand, heart in heart, praying together exactly as scripture told us to do to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and in doing that there are at least five things I want you to pray for I want you to pray for families that have lost loved ones and have lost their homes in the disaster of last week's brutal savage animal like attack in Israel pray for those families they need your prayers. Amen? Amen. I want you to pray for the government of Israel. That they would seek God's guidance and seek his wisdom. I want you to pray for the leaders around the world, including the leaders of our own country, as all of us are involved in this conflict. I want you to pray for a quick and decisive end to this present conflict. And last, I want you to pray for those who are being held captive as hostages in Gaza and for their families that are so concerned for them. And after we've spent some time in smaller groups praying together, I'm going to ask Pastor Irby to come and lead us in a last word and in a final prayer. I pray the peace of Jerusalem. Break up in small groups and spend some time in prayer.